What even is the point of cooking at home? This has been a non-question for most humans, because for most of human history, the only person who was going to turn this into this into this was you. I prepare food because I want to eat. That's been all of the reasoning that most humans who've ever lived have ever needed. From our hunter-gatherer life, to our agrarian life, and even into much of our industrial life, the only person who was going to feed you was most likely going to be you, or someone in your immediate social group. But now, for people like me, living in highly developed post-industrial economies, because I want to eat is probably one of the weakest reasons for cooking, in my opinion. We live in a world where this chicken costs about the same as this chicken from the same store. And in this world, I think it really pays to interrogate why we would buy this one. Field trip to Oxford, not that Oxford, Oxford, Georgia, where Dr. Derek Shannon is a sociology professor at Oxford College of Emory University. He specializes in things like political economy and teaches a course here that's quite relevant to our discussion. The sociology of food course that I designed is a part of what Oxford College calls uh, our theory practice service learning program. Part of what my students do is work here on Oxford's organic farm. Look at this place. Even in the middle of February, it's beautiful. The apple trees over here are blooming. They've got all these garlic and onions and cabbage going. But anyway, if you ask Dr. Shannon what's the point of cooking at home these days, the first thing he says is... Uh, because it's an enjoyable and desirable activity. Some people like cooking. Just like some people like knitting when you can go buy a sweater for cheaper than the materials that it might take. Indeed, the first good reason for cooking at home is because it's fun. This is, in my view, an unassailable reason for doing anything that isn't particularly harmful to others or particularly harmful to your long-term fun-having capacity. I recently put out a recipe for French macaroons in which I encouraged people to loosen their expectations about how these things should look. If you just care about how they taste and leave the cosmetics up to fate, they become as easy to make as they are delicious. But if you derive pleasure from working to create cosmetically perfect macaroons, I think that's great. You have my blessing. Not that you asked for it. My argument is only this. If it's making you miserable to try to create perfectly round, smooth domes with perfect little ruffled feet, then stop. Make the ugly ones, or buy the beautiful ones. Also, maybe try to think a little bit more critically about whether the things that you do really do make you happy. This is something I try really hard to do, especially with regard to my creative work. Am I struggling to make this thing because I enjoy the challenge? Good reason! Am I struggling to make this thing because I'll learn something valuable from the struggle? Good reason! Part of the reason I've spent so much time and effort trying to recreate the New York-style pizza from my youth was pure curiosity. I wanted to understand on a tactile level what makes that stuff taste the way it does. Am I working to make this thing because the end product will give me joy? Good reason! I think this chicken tastes way better than this chicken. Am I going through hell to make this thing because someone will give me money for it at the end? You gotta get paid, son! Am I slaving over this thing because it will make someone else happy? Really good reason. Maybe the best reason. Am I killing myself on this thing because I think it will impress someone? Hmm, not such a good reason, in my opinion. Look, this is a conversation about the meaning of life we're having here, so reasonable people are going to disagree. But in my view, cooking should be about nourishing and nurturing people, including yourself. It should be about giving people pleasure, including yourself. And while you might be able to make yourself happy by dazzling people with your skills, I would question whether that's in the interest of your long-term happiness or maybe your deeper, more meaningful happiness. And I would definitely wonder if it might be pleasure that you're taking at someone else's expense. This phenomenon was brilliantly crystallized in the 2010 South Park episode, Cream Frige. I can't play too much of it for you without angering the copyright gods, but you should go watch it. The Hulu link is in the description. Every time you watch cooking shows, you stay up all night trying to copy what they made! Well, I'm sorry if there's something wrong with me helping out with the cooking! Can I have a Pop-Tart? So in this instance, the harm is relatively mild, right? Randy's family is annoyed that he is flexing on them rather than providing them with the food they actually want to eat. And they're annoyed that he is filling the house with misery and stress and dirty dishes in the process. Mild harm. I do think that there's some more serious or pernicious harm associated with this phenomenon. 
One of the things that sociologists of food study is how a range of relations of inequality are embedded in our food supply chain. And that's not just buying, it also includes preparing, cooking, and so on. And it's not very difficult to find differentials in who has to cook and who gets to cook and when. Um, who gets prestige in the act of cooking and who doesn't and so on. Right. Who is a chef? Who is a cook? And who is a food service worker? And is the difference between those people really as stark as their different social and economic statuses would indicate? I don't think it necessarily is. And I think that when we cook to display our prowess, we maybe reinforce the social attitudes that contribute toward that inequity. At the very least, we look like total tools. Uh. By the way, I want to acknowledge that I am guilty of everything I'm decrying right here. I am hardly without sin, and I am throwing stones. I'm throwing them right at myself. But anyway, if we're going to talk about potential harm to others, there's way more concrete material we can cover, right? Like, does cooking at home do more or less to damage or deplete our planet's biosphere and the people who live in it? There's an argument you could make that buying prepared foods from a store or from a restaurant is less taxing on the world's resources, simply because of the economies of scale, the efficiency of mass production. Well, I mean, there's a few counter arguments. One, you know, economists oftentimes view uh, economic models as if humans are these sort of rational utility maximizing machines, and in which case then, you know, of course it's going to be cheaper to buy something off of the dollar menu in terms of both money and time uh, than to buy an organic spread that you go home and cook, right? You know, but, but what if we talked about cooking some set of processed foods that are super soy heavy, right? The, the cost of cooking that is going to be quite different in, in energy than the cost of cooking, say, something that was organically grown on, on this farm right here. Um, those calculations then are going to look quite different. It may be better for me to go buy an organic meal than to cook at home, uh, a meal of processed goods with, you know, a whole lot of monocropped... Mono uh, Wait, what did he say there? Mono what? You know, a whole lot of monocrap. Sorry, I just think monocrap is a pretty funny Freudian slip. Because there's an argument that says a lot of the cheap prepared foods we buy are not cheap because they are economically or environmentally efficient to produce, they're cheap because they're government subsidized, like corn. Corn is hugely subsidized here in the United States. And while there may be legitimate policy motives behind those subsidies, or totally craven political motives, it is also true that corn and similar crops are heavy on calories but light on other nutrition. And yeah, they're also the big monocraps. I mean crops. Monocrop means that you're trying to grow a single crop and you know that form of farming is, is designed in such a way to to kill anything that could get in the way of growing this single cash crop. Uh, that leads then to losses in biodiversity and things like that. So yeah, the environmental calculation is tough, and science shows us how reality can often be very different from what you would intuitively expect. Such is the case with the sponsor of this video, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit whom I'll now take a minute to thank. You might suspect that all this packaging, recycled and recyclable though much of it is, would give meal kits a bigger carbon footprint than cooking the same meal from a grocery store. But that is not true, according to a 2019 study out of the University of Michigan. This is not industry-funded research. It was paid for by the National Science Foundation. Looking at the overall supply chain, researchers found that meal kits kits create less greenhouse gas because the pre-portioned ingredients result in less food waste, and food waste is the big culprit. Am I being paid to say that to you right now? Yes, ads pay for content so that we don't have to. But it is also the case that what I just said to you is true, according to this independent scholarship from one of the world's top research universities. HelloFresh obviates a lot of the arguments against home cooking. The easy step-by-step -step instructions and pre-portioned ingredients take a ton of the stress and worry out of shopping and cooking, especially if you're not super confident in the kitchen yet. Also, it's a kit, and I always find kits fun to do. HelloFresh is flexible, you can change your meal plan whenever you want, we're still on calorie smart, and in 30 minutes I've got this super tasty plate of lean protein and veggies. Get you some at HelloFresh.com. Use code ADAMRAGUSI at 10 for 10 free meals, including free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com, enter ADAMRAGUSI at 10 for 10 free meals. That's all down in the description. Thank you, HelloFresh.
That whole issue of food waste leads to the next good reason to cook at home. It is cheaper. Is it cheaper? It absolutely can be cheaper, but it depends on what you're cooking, and it depends on how much of it you're cooking, and it depends on whether or not you're minimizing waste. Take coq au vin, chicken stewed in wine, one of the great peasant stews of French cuisine. It's a meal born of rural poverty, not of courtly opulence, as is the case with lots of other French classics. You can totally cook this at home for less money than you would pay at your local bistro, but not if you're just trying to make one or two portions. Efficiency is achieved with scale. In a restaurant, they achieve scale by making a few different dishes for a whole ton of people every night. In your kitchen, you achieve scale by making a big batch of one thing and eating many meals from it, especially if you're just feeding yourself or a small family. Or maybe you achieve scale by buying a lot of one ingredient and then making a bunch of slightly different meals from it. Regardless, you can't expect the same level of variety that you would get if you were eating out at a restaurant for every meal. And you certainly can't expect to follow every single recipe to the letter if you want to eat cheaply. Like, coq au vin is cheap to make, but not if you buy the $6 bottle of Herbes de Provence that the recipe calls for and then push it to the back of your cabinet and never cook with it again. You gotta get comfortable with using the fresh rosemary you do have instead of the Herbes de Provence you don't have. Or if you do get the Herbes de Provence, you gotta get used to the idea of down the road using it in that recipe that calls for poultry seasoning. Substitutions minimize waste, and minimizing waste saves you money. That's why good recipes don't just tell you what to do, they tell you why, thus empowering you to think for yourself. And you can be like, oh, I don't have that, but I've got this other thing that could potentially perform the same function. That's what's really gonna help you to cook efficiently and to save money by cooking at home. End of home ec lecture. Let's go back to sociology class. The final and perhaps most important reason to cook your own food is to forge and maintain social bonds. Some people use the term commensality for, for people cooking and eating together. Food is related integrally to our sense of community, and in some cases our sense of identity, which might be another reason why people would choose to cook. I can cook X thing in a way, and it expresses a sense of who I am, and it fits the sense of taste that I was raised to develop, right? Take me, for example. I am half third-generation Italian-American, half general-issue Euro-American mutt. That's my mom's side. I live a thousand miles from my parents and my brother and everyone I grew up with. Thanks to technological change, I live my life very differently from how my grandparents lived theirs, and compared to their grandparents, I might as well be a freaking Martian. What keeps me clinging to the tattered shreds of a cross-generational cultural identity I have left is food. It's cooking. It's the things my dad taught me to cook. It's the things I will teach my boys to cook. The stove is the shrine where I convene with my ancestors. Laugh if you want to, but a big sloppy Italian-American red sauce is the continuity of my life. Me, my forebearers, and my descendants were all meatballs swimming in that sauce. The sauce makes me feel not so bad about being at the statistical midpoint of my life. The sauce is tangible evidence that something of my grandparents' life lives on, and that something of my life will live on. Yes, it will change, it will mutate, it will hybridize, it will adapt as it should. Hopefully it'll get better, but it will go on. Cooking gives us those connections, to say nothing of the connections that it helps us forge with other people's cultures. That's why I cook at home. Tell me why you do. <laughs>